I'm going to probably do is go ahead and do a missionary letter real quick, and then we're going to have to uh, see if we can do a song if we can from there. So with that said, um, have one from Robert Collison. They're in Nebraska. I can't, Alagala or something like that. Alagala la. Uh, but anyway, it's out in the far end of Nebraska. And this is from uh, the end of January. He says this, thankfully the weather this month was significantly better than last January. This year we only had to cancel one Wednesday night service due to, due to illness. He says midway through the month, a couple named uh, Poppy and Cindy attended the Sunday morning service. They moved to Alagalala from Colorado a couple years ago. They have been attending uh, a church, um, different kind of church, but yet they felt that they needed to do something different. He says, uh, Poppy grew up bouncing around to different churches. And while they don't know exactly what Baptist church is, uh, they attended as a youth. He was pleased when they found the service reminding him of the old time Baptist church that, from his childhood. They are encouraged because Cindy attended a ladies Bible study. Both Poppy and Cindy uh, are searching. They recognize their need for something in their lives, but no, not, uh, no. And we know that it's God's words have the answers. So we ask uh, that you join us in prayer, praying that God will work in their lives, show them their need of a savior. Goes on and says, God continues to work in the lives of the members here at this church. Some of are working through personal struggles and giving God control over areas where vice has taken hold. Others are working to mend relationship and discern God's will for their lives. Through all the different situations brought to our attention, my wife and I are continually reminded of the importance of directing people to God's word. Yet again, we are thankful to have the opportunity to see God working in the lives of the people and, and to have a part in what God is doing there. While this winter has been more mild than last, we still have people that travel nearly an hour to attend services on Sunday and Wednesday. We're encouraged by the desire and dedication of the people to be in God's house and pray for their safety as they travel. One family is the Way family. They have uh, um, two granddaughters with uh, Jim and Kathy. And it says uh, they travel nearly an hour to join us on Sundays. They have not been able to attend as often due to illness and bad, uh, a bad fall that Kathy had in December. Anytime they are with us, they are encouraged in what is going on, and they have a sweet, positive, positive spirit about them and genuinely uh, seem, to be, uh, seem to love being around God's people. Our prayer is that God would show the church, uh, our prayer is that God would show the church he would have them join so that they could grow and serve him. He says, nothing of great significance is planned for February, but we are excited about the prospects God has brought our way and will use the coming month to develop relationships and labor to see God's work in the lives of all those that he has brought to, uh, brought their way. And he says, uh, thank you for their prayers and support and uh, pray for wisdom as well as that one family, Poppy and Cindy, but also wisdom for those who are whom God is working. So let's pray for them real quickly. And again, remember those that are going through some physical struggle, Brother Jim, right now, and that they get that corrected and just help him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would guide, direct in our lives. And we think of uh, Robert there in the far reaches of, of Nebraska and yet very spaced out to where someone looking for a church has to drive an hour sometimes. And we pray, O oh Lord, you would guide, direct, and stir hearts and lives there. Help them to find faithful people that, uh, and for them to be faithful as uh, they lead the people to follow God's word, that, that lives will be changed and, and make a difference. Guide, direct now, and help them and help us as we try to reach out that uh, we might be able to, to help them by prayer and by support and, and just help to be a part of their ministry. Guide direct now, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Miss Connie, would you want to come and we'll...
change gears here. And we're going to do something very simple. We're just going to have one song, but we're going to do page 451, Trust and Obey, 451. All right, 451, if you can stand and join me on this, 451, Trust and Obey. dismiss the teen class we'll be in proverbs 21 thank you miss miss connie proverbs chapter 21 
Again, I appreciate Brother Blaine helping me out last week. Had a lot on the plate last week with the, conf- the, the, the preaching services and stuff, Monday and Tuesday, so that gave me a little bit of a chance to catch my breath. And I enjoy hearing him. I need to hear preaching. So it's good for me as well. With that said, we started a couple weeks ago on Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2. Well, we just got started, so we're going to begin there, restart that again, and go forward uh, if we can. And um, actually, we'll see if, how far we can make it in here. We'll get a few verses down. But if you can stand and join me, Proverbs chapter 21, let's read first few verses. Follow along as I read. 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water he turneth, it whithersoever he will. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the, to the Lord than sacrifice. And high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of, the, but of every one that is hasty only to want. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. The robbery of the wicked shall destroy them, because they refuse to do judgment. The way of, the, the way of man is froward and strange, but as for the pure, his work is right. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. The soul of the wicked desireth evil, his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. You may be seated. See if we make it through all those notes. But we'll start with verse 2. Here, we, again, we touched on it, just got started on it. I want to look at this again. Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Back in chapter 16, in chapter 16, and in verse 2, here it says, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. And then in that same chapter, chapter 16, verse 25, it says, there is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So man, we have a way of, of glossing over things and making things look okay, and we can just about justify anything in our own eyes, but the Lord looks at it from a whole different perspective. And again, let's look at some things here. The natural man exclaims, the end justifies the means. And this verse here completely just abolishes that that crazy and wicked statement. The end does not justify the means. Just so you get what you want doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to get to it. There is truth. There is righteousness, and uh, it, the end does not justify the means. But again, we have a way to tur- turn things and twist things to make it seem like it's right. Th- going through the, the Gospel of John, um, the Pharisees looked at what was happening, and they even give a tribute that they understood what was happening and completely went 180 degree from it because they could not see Jesus as the Savior that they expected him to be. He didn't match up with them, so therefore they justified trying to kill him and did everything they could to destroy him. And again, man, you can justify your actions in your own mind, but the Lord looks within the heart and he sees the motives that we have. God's reply to this verse, if you go back to chapter 28 and verse 26. twenty-eight, twenty-six. Remember our verse, our text says, Every way of, of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the hearts. Twenty-eight, twenty-six says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. Again, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. A couple of other verses that come to my mind when I think of this. We need to 
to look beyond the, the outside things and really look at the motive of the heart. And one verse I have, it's probably very famous, but it's Hebrews 4.12. It says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says, piercing even to the dividing of the soul and spirit is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I think I got that verse right, but that last part, very key part here. He's a discerner, or the word of God is, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not just our outside actions, but the inner motive. Another verse that's very familiar to some, you've heard the verse, and turn to this one if you would. Go back to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Because I have stated this verse before, but you've got to look at two verses actually here. There's two connected. Verse 17, 9. Now let's pick up verse 17, 7. It's a great verse as well. Here we have in Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. It goes on, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see heat. See when heat cometh, well, heat won't bother it. Got a good source of, of, of nourishment, but her leaf will be, shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither uh, shall cease from yielding fruit. Then we have verse nine, very famous verse. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. But don't stop there, go to verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Came across this word reins recently, I think on Sunday. But again, we think of the reins of a horse. And though a horse is a very huge animal, with a couple little straps of leather, you can control and turn that horse. You with me? Well, when it talks about the reins of man, we don't have straps of leather to us, but God has a way of being able to turn us and focus us by pulling our spiritual reins, so to speak. He, our inward, not even say spiritual, but our inward reins. And uh, again, we got to understand, 1710, Jeremiah 1710, God says, I try the reins, even to give uh, every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. One more verse real quickly is Revelation chapter uh, 2, verse 23, when it's talking to the different churches, that uh, letters to the churches. He says this, Jesus says, I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He sees the works, but he, he knows the intent of the heart. So come back to this, and let's apply some things. Even as born-again believers must be careful not to trust our own hearts, Peter, a good example, one that was close to the Lord, he was rebuked by the Lord in Matthew 16 because Jesus talked of his coming death, and, and Peter says, no, no, you can't do that. Jesus turned to him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Not that he was turned over to Satan, but he was following the path that Satan was trying to do, trying to stop him from going to the cross. And uh, Peter, great, great man, but yet uh, he was rebuked because he wasn't following God's will instead of his own will. And we can, we don't know, we can't even grasp God's will. We need to allow God to lead us and direct us. We are the sheep. We need to follow the shepherd, not the shepherd follow us. We need to follow the shepherd. Uh, another example was James and John. The other two, or the inner three, you have Peter, James, and John. Well, Peter, he just rebuked James and John. They saw some people that uh, weren't doing what they thought, so they said, Lord, can we call fire down from heaven to consume them? Jesus says, you don't know what spirit that you're from. Again, they didn't understand 
God's will. They were justified in their mind. They thought, well, these people, it was a, it was a city in Samaria, Samaria that, that refused to open up to him because he wasn't going to stay. He just wanted to pass through. He had a purpose. He had a time. They didn't understand that. And uh, so they were offended. Well, James and John, let's call fire down from heaven. No, 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 no. They're not to be judged. They didn't understand what's going on. God had his timing, and God needed to get going. He was getting close to the cross, but at the same time, we got to be careful what spirit we have. Um, again, our text says, every way of man is right in his own eyes. The Lord ponders the hearts. We need to go back to that model prayer where Jesus told him, this is how you need to pray. It's not what we need to memorize to pray, but how, certain things we need to be praying for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those are two key areas. That means God's will above my will and your will, not my way. Thy will be done. That's, the, that's, the, the, that's spoken by a servant. Thy will be done. We need to be less in controlling our reins and being willing to let God direct us and be the, the right servant we need to be. Amen? You with me? Let's go to verse, back to 21, verse 3. Proverbs 21, verse 3. Here we have, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. This proverb looks at the actions of men which show the heart. Very similar to what we've been talking about. And if we truly love God, we will desire to follow his commandments. It's very clear. Over and over in the New Testament, you see that Jesus will say, if you love me, keep my commandments. You might say you love me, but your actions don't line up unless you follow through and you're doing what I've told you to do. Um, with that thought, again, if we truly love God, we will desire to do his commandments. To do right is more important. Here's one example. Blaine, Hung, if you want him to do something, it's better for him to do it than to bring you flowers when he doesn't do it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm a husband, I understand. I'm there. Tim, you understand what I'm saying? So much better to, to do what's right than to bring flowers of apology afterwards. And uh, what is a sacrifice? Sacrifice is covering our sins because we did not do right. That's what a sacrifice is about. There are also peace offerings too, yes, but uh, it's more important to do right than to give flowers after our selfish or evil actions. Key thoughts is found throughout the scriptures. Over and over you find it back in Psalms, or excuse me, not Psalms, but 1 Samuel chapter 15. King Saul was sent to go and to wipe out the Amalekites. They had been evil. They were doing, and it's all in Deuteronomy, go to the background of why God had pulled them for judgment. And he went and battled against the Malachites. He only went to one city, didn't follow through, and came back. And God says, don't take anything, destroy everything. He brought back the king, at least the king. That's what we know about, but uh, we can find out some more if we can get a little bit farther. But he brings back animals for sacrifice, it sounds like. Or was it for their own fields? Was it for their own spoils? Because when Samuel shows up, he says, what's this I'm hearing? You said you obeyed, but why do I hear all these animals? He says, well, the people wanted to do sacrifice. Isn't that what we do normally? When we get caught, it's their fault. The people said, no, we need to obey rather than sacrifice. And by the way, if he had truly gone through and had removed the Malachites, one day, wayward King Saul 
would die at the hand of Amalekite that he was supposed to have removed. He would be killed by Amalekite. Interesting. Let's go a little farther. Um, here, here's one I want you to look at. Um, Mark chapter 7. Here's what the Lord taught on this same principle of obeying is better than sacrifice. Back in Mark chapter 7. Pharisees were upset at, his, at Jesus' uh, disciples because they were eating bread with unwashed hands. I've been told, go wash your hands. Yeah, I've been told that, but that doesn't make you a sinner for that. And, but that was one of their extra rules they had added. Down at chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus responds to that question, but eat bread with unwashed hands. He says in verse 6, but he answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Not commandments of God, the key thing is commandments of men. And then he explains, verse, four, uh, verse 8, excuse me, uh, 7 8 says, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as in the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things, which they called a sin if you didn't do their rules. It wasn't in the Bible. It was these extra traditions. He goes on, he says, verse 9, he says, He said them full well ye reject the commandment of God, ye may keep your own tradition. And he gives an example here of Corban, where they would, let's just read, um, verse 10, it says, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth fa father and mother, let him die the death. That's one of the Ten Commandments. But yet, what did they do? They would say, verse 11, uh, If a man shall say to his father and mother, It is Corban. And, and yeah, it explains, that is to say a gift. They would say, All my wealth I'm going to give to God. Well, they didn't actually give it all immediately. They didn't give it all to God. They just dedicated it to God in statement, but not in practice. Because they kept all their money. Well, they might give something to the, 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 the Pharisees, or not the Pharisees, but the, the rulers, but they kept the lion's share of it, but it was now it wasn't their money. It was God's money, and they couldn't do what God said Take care of your mother, mother and father. Oh, it's not my, God, my, not my money now. It's God's money. Well, they were eating and, and buying and selling things every day, but they couldn't take care of their parents because it's a gift. It's been given to God. See how they made a loophole, as we call it today, to try to get around what God has said. Let's give you another example. Go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 Here in Mark chapter 12, pick up in verse 28. They're trying to trip up Jesus. This is the end of the Gospel of Mark, right before he goes to the cross. So they, they're trying to trick him with sayings and, and get him to where he doesn't understand. Well, he's God. He knows. Look at what happens. 1228. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered the, the other group well, um, ask him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And he adds to it, the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Verse 32 goes on and says, Well, and the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, honestly, he said unto him, 
thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any questions. Notice what, what he said. This man, understanding, says to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your shoulders, with all your strength, with all your might, to, to do that is greater than all of the sacrifices and burnt offerings. What are they? They're the flowers given in apology when we don't do right. When we love God, and if we love him, we keep his commandments, we do right. It's greater than sacrifices. You know, yes, there's peace offerings that we give in worship, but the sacrifices were, were made to apologize, seek forgiveness for where they messed up. I'll give you another place real quickly. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Probably the climax of the book of Hebrews is chapter 8, 9, and 10. And it's followed up by application as he applies it to the great hall of listing of, of, of uh, great men of faith and women of faith in chapter 11 and application after that. But 8, 9, and 10 is showing how Christ, not just better than Moses and not better than angels, but he is the great high priest. He has a better... Uh, priesthood, a better sacrifice, and it describes how he became that sacrifice. Look at chapter 10 in the first 10 verses. Lengthy passage here, but understand this. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Time out. The law commanded them to give an offering once a year, the Day of Atonement, that would cover the sins of the nation and move it for another year. But it didn't take care of the sacrifice. It just covered it for another year, looking forward to a great sacrifice that would come. Here he says, again, verse 1, the law, the most it could do was just, it was a shadow, a picture of something that would come later in the future, namely Jesus Christ. Can never, with those sacrifices, be able to replace what God wants for us. He wants us to have a right heart, and that's why Jesus came. As you continue through this passage, it goes on. It says, uh, verse 10 too, for then would they, the sacrifices, not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscious of sin, if they paid the price, if they were done, if it satisfied God, you wouldn't have to have any more. But every year, more sacrifices, year after year. He goes on, verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of the sins every year. For it is not possible, it says this, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, he when, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices uh, for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. That didn't really please God. It was still just covering till they could come future. He goes on, he says, verse 7, Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, this is Christ, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take away the first, first covenant of the law, that he may establish the second, a covenant through his shed blood, Many times talk about the way of grace. He goes on, he says, verse 10, by which will, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He came to pay the price because sacrifices and offerings could never replace doing right. And uh, we can't do right. 
That's why he had to come in our place and live a perfect life. He didn't just come down and, and come and die on the cross and go back up. He lived entire life, 33 years probably, as a perfect example of how to obey fully. Never did sin. He had to live perfect life that he could be the one that could take our place. And he did take our place and sacrificed himself for us and became our sacrifice so that we don't need any more sacrifices. And again, now that we've been covered with the blood of Christ, there's one, God, one thing God wants to do. Do right. Do right. How could we do it now? Well, there's something different that's happened if you've truly been born again. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to give you wisdom on how to do right. You have the Holy Spirit that is all-powerful. He is the third part of the triune God who has the power to help us do right and the wisdom to show us how to do right. We can do right. It's up to us to follow his steps. And again, verse uh, 3 says, to do justice and judgment, do right. Just, judgment and righteousness are very similar uh, applications, that same Hebrew word there. So to do right is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. He did the sacrifice so that we can do right. Uh, for sake of time, let's go a little bit farther, but Isaiah chapter 1, it's a great time to, to read. It talks about how wicked Israel is, but yet God says, come, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, should be white as snow. He can help us. Paul talked about a living sacrifice, gifts of grace that we can do his will. I, I like this. We read, I can't remember uh, which verse it is. We'd have to look it up again. But uh, the author, James Samus of Trust and Obey, I think it's about verse 3, he says this, but we never can prove the lights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, favor is the same as grace, for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. One ex last example I have in contrast, Luke chapter 15 talks about the prodigal son. And the prodigal son didn't deserve anything from the father once he left home. He didn't deserve a thing. But the father still loved him. And when he came back, the father embraced him and put him back in a position of being a son. Then there's the elder brother. The elder brother, he had outward obedience, but his true heart was revealed by his anger, which showed his prideful spirit when he refused to even come in the house because that wicked son came back home. Sad. Had no love at all. And a lack of love shows he wasn't really following as he should. Let's come back to Proverbs, see if we can do another verse here. Proverbs chapter 21. Twenty-one and verse four. And high look, and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. A high look, proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. I'm going to do a couple of verses real quickly out of Proverbs, way back to chapter six. Chapter six lists several things that the Lord hates. He says, verse six sixteen, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abound or abomination to him. So these are the seven things. And when they say that, this is throughout the Old Testament, there's several times where they, they give you a number, then add one. That's for intensity. That's for it to be emphatic. So when he says these six and yea, seven, he's saying these are things God hates. Look at number one in verse 17, a proud look. The first one God lists is a proud look. Because he knows that is our greatest problem we face. The greatest sin we deal with is our own pride. Proud look, he goes on and lists several things there. Go to chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 8. And here in verse 13, several times it talks about the fear of the Lord. 
And in Proverbs 8, 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward, that's not forward, but froward, F-R-O, is, means perverse, wicked. The froward mouth do I hate. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, colon. How does he describe evil? Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way. It's the pride that causes the evil way. It's listed later because the actions come from the heart. And when the heart is proudful, we will do what is best interest of numero uno, ourselves, instead of God, and therefore it will be evil. No matter what we try to justify in our mind, we saw that a couple of verses ago, it will be evil because we're not doing it following God, we're doing it for a selfish motive. So, fear the Lord to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way in the froward mouth do I hate. Um, one more place is chapter 16. Back on our way back to Proverbs 21, we go to chapter 16. In verse 5, let's pick up verse 4. It says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Then he goes on, he says, Though hand joined in hand, they shall not be unpunished. No matter how much they try to band together to defy God, they're not going to be, they're going to be able to be unpunished. They will be punished. But proud in heart is abomination to the Lord. Uh, one other place I'll give it to you real quickly is Psalms 101 in verse 5. He says, Whoso privately slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. And him that hath an high look and a proud heart, I will not suffer. So proud, the, the proud heart shows itself in that high look. You've seen the people that have that look to where they look up like they're above other people. They put themselves above others. The Pharisees are a great example out of the New Testament. They thought themselves privileged. They thought that they were the ones that were chosen by God and that they looked at everybody else as lower level. Uh, John chapter 7, when somebody were to would actually question what they said, they just wrote them off and says, you don't even have any idea. How could you even know? I'm a Pharisee. And uh, that proud look, the high look, a proud heart. Um, we are not to look down upon another because when we come right down to it, remember, a, a quote I heard years ago by a famous general back in the Civil War. It was actually Robert, uh, Robert, Robert Lee stated, stated this statement. He says, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Every one of us, if we're going to find salvation... It's going to be by humbling ourselves before God. There is no one that is better than another. We are all, the Bible is very clearly, we have all become guilty before God, Romans chapter 3. We've got to understand ourselves and truly see ourselves as God sees us. And when we humble ourselves, then we can begin to open the treasures of God's grace. Humble yourselves before, um, I can't remember it. Let me get it real quickly. Yeah, there it is. Let me just read you this passage, and then we'll, we'll stop with that. James chapter 4 in the New Testament says this. It says, uh, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy? The answer is, he says, be giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humbled. 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. He says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. We have a high opinion of ourselves. We need to knock a couple levels down and understand we are no better than anybody else. We are all just as dirt before God. Amen? And as we understand, he is great, and he is willing to use us and to empower us. He loves us. He cares for us. But he hates a proud look or a high look and a proud heart. He hates that because it shows the selfishness within. We must learn to follow God and be careful. I have one more note here. If I turn my page here. Back in Luke chapter 12, the Bible describes a man that was very prosperous. He was a farmer and he was able to see great dividends, bumper crops. So his barns were filled and he began to think that he could take credit for that. He had not caused the sun to shine down. He had not brought the rain. He had not brought uh, the lack of pestilence upon his crops. He just thought that he was the greatest farmer that ever lived. So he was going to tear down his barns and build greater. And when they were full, then he would be set for life. And he could just relax and do whatever he wanted because he's in charge. If you know the text there in Luke chapter 12, God goes like this. He says, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then what will happen to all this stuff? that you were counting on. We got to understand, I'm nothing but dirt, but God loves me and cares for me, and I can do great things for God as long as I don't get high-minded and thinking of myself more than just dirt, used by the grace of God. I'm a conduit. I am a source of, for God to use, I hope to be a empty, worthy vessel to be used for his service. But God can't use me if I'm full of me. I've got to be emptied out before God can use me, cleanse me, and use me. Our problem is we are filling ourselves up with our own pride, and we can't be used of God. Sad. We'll go ahead, right at the top of the hour, we'll stop there and pick up some more as we go down through here through Proverbs. God bless you, you're dismissed.